So I'm going to talk about our state uh, debris management strategy and focus, uh, since most of the rest of the, the presentations have also dealt with debris management planning, I'll try to just kind of look at um, some of those things that, as you said, are important for making sure that you uh, get your maximum reimbursement um, through state and federal um, uh, reimbursement programs, since that's uh, key to um, a lot of our, our survival and um, there is a lot of reimbursement out there. Uh, debris is uh, one of the largest components uh, of any uh, emergency recovery activity. Uh, the, that's our, um, you know, sort of our emergency response, the category A and B under the FEMA programs, generally accounts for approximately 60% unless you have something that has a whole lot of uh, public facility damage. So it's very important to have uh, your, thing, you know, your plans lined up in advance in order to make sure that you can um, uh, sort of uh, take greatest advantage of, of those recovery, act, of, uh, recovery activities. As was mentioned in the other presentations, um, you know, the recent experiences have shown lots and lots of, of uh, debris. We had a great amount of debris during the Southern California fires. Um, they are still doing de debris removal from Hurricane Katrina and they will be for, uh, for quite a bit of time in, in the future, particularly the debris that has ended up in their waterways. It's been uh, sort of a challenge to, to figure out how to, to manage uh, that debris problem. A variety of disasters, almost all kinds of disasters will cause uh, a debris problem, some greater than others, and as was mentioned before, some uh, have different problems, whether you're also uh, looking at it as uh, a crime scene, uh, whether you're still trying to recover victims, uh, whether you're looking at um, ability for, for example, during a, an earthquake to allow uh, people to come back in and try to recover um, their um, personal belongings or for businesses to come in and recover their um, essential records uh, before uh, demolition and removal of those, uh, of those facility, uh, that debris. Uh, hazardous materials uh, contamination uh, of debris and how you uh, sort of sort that out and how you deal with that. Animal carcasses, as was, uh, as was mentioned, uh, the disposal of those and, and how you separate that out from the remainder of the debris. And again, how you're just going to manage this lar large amount of, uh, of debris. A, a variety of different kinds of things, as was mentioned, uh, from full range, from just your normal um, sort of green waste to things that can easily be um, uh, recycled to uh, just tons and tons of, of just plain dirt. Uh, so again, all sorting this out and making sure that it gets to the proper, uh, proper location. In terms of uh, your debris management plan, um, key to look at uh, your, the types of potential hazards that you're facing. Uh, you're certainly your local um, hazard, uh, hazard mitigation plan is one place to start to identify the, the hazards and, and potential risks associated in your community as well as your uh, terrorism um, response plans or your hazardous materials response plans which may not in all communities be totally integrated with your um, hazard mitigation plan. But again, variety of types of, of places to look for the potential disasters and what the consequences of those are. Certainly the ability to forecast the type and amount of debris will help you because by forecasting uh, during your planning process can easily be turned into estimating when you start to um, uh, enter into the recovery process and begin uh, contracting and looking at uh, you know, sort of how you're going to uh, tackle the problem. Eligibility issues uh, certainly should be considered as you develop your plan. Although I would not say just because something is not eligible under a FEMA requirement that it not be addressed. And this is an area that I know that um, uh, it was dealt with both in the um, civil unrest um, in Los Angeles and in the fires um, in Southern California in 2003 is the whole issue of uh, private property, uh, debris removal from private property. Uh, FEMA doesn't like to pay for debris removal from private property. Uh, at the state level, we really believe there should be an integrated approach and that there is some way of, I think, reaching a happy medium uh, to reimburse uh, jurisdictions for the most efficient way to help your community recover. And that's whether that's coming up with, in, during your plan, having a process for involving private property owners and the insurance folks in the decision about how you're going to deal with uh, large-scale debris so that it, whether it gets hauled out to, to the curb or it gets, uh, you know, sort of picked up 
uh, sort of collectively there's a way of dividing out the costs uh, so that that if private um, uh, particularly insurance proceeds can be recovered that there's a way of doing that but that the whole that the focus is on restoration of the community not just simply be you know complying with those with those regulations so again to the extent that you can build that into your plan it provides some documentation to be able to go back to FEMA uh, to say that yes in fact this is how we plan to do it this is how it's divided up here's how we implemented the plan and thus this is how this is what you should pay and you know, sort of your portion of the bill may not work but it, at least by having it in the plan it, it's not just a, a sort of fly-by-night um, or uh, uh, expedient um, solution at the time but uh, again uh, building in those plans the plan needs to identify as, as has been mentioned how you're going to store collect sort finally dispose of uh, of all those materials um, and again uh, the plan should identify all those responsible agencies uh, from the sort of your normal regular partners to to those kinds of odd partners that, that may come in um, for a, a specific um, issue or something. Certainly look at the capabilities um, of your own in-house resources and identify the gaps and uh, so where you can reach out to um, other entities, be they through um, mutual aid to other local jurisdictions, uh, to your contracting resources, uh, to the federal government uh, under, uh, for example, under Corps of Engineers contracts. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the things that have happened since Katrina. Is, uh, there's been a flurry of new policies coming out from FEMA um, in the last about six weeks as they geared up for the new hurricane season, particularly involving debris because of the problems that they had um, in the Gulf Coast um, last year. Other items to be included in the plan should be um, identification of your uh, sensitive environmental areas and historic structures because dealing with those is going to take um, sort of extra, extra time, extra considerations, um, and um, fall through uh, extra requirements. Um, uh, again, this is sure the issue of private property debris removal. Uh, contracting procedures in place. Uh, one of the things that we're facing now, um, and we have the last couple of disasters, is jurisdictions that have um, uh, sort of too, used too, um, too broadly time and materials contracts. Um, FEMA does not like time and materials contracts um, and uh, generally they're not eligible. We kind of had tried to get them to, to at least think that particularly during the first, you know, 48, 72 hours where really what you need to do is, is do that immediate stuff to clear roadways, uh, to be able to allow rescue activities to occur or to allow evacuations to occur, that there, are, there may be a need to enter into some of those agreements to do that then but they're very strongly, that in fact, they're not paying for it after 72 hours. So it's very important to have your pre-identified contractors, your uh, boilerplate contracts, uh, scopes of work, all of that sort of stuff ahead of time and so that you can at least go through a process, even if it's just taking out three contractors out to the site and, and say, how would you approach this and, and taking one of those bids. At least some kind of documentation to show that you went through a bid process is very important. The key to a successful disaster debris program is advanced planning, and I would say that's both advanced planning in terms of doing the plan now so that it's not, you're not trying to sort of do it on the, on the fly at the time of the disaster, but also the role of advanced planning at the time of the disaster. And that is sitting down from hour one and starting to plan out how you're going to approach the debris management problem, getting out the plans, how does that uh, actually relate to the, to the disaster situation that you're facing at that time and at being an active part of the planning process in your local EOC and as, as you work through that to not just what you need to do right now but what you need to do in 48 hours or what you need to do in a week from now so that by making a decision now you're not precluding um, something going on in the future and one of, one of the big things that we're looking at now as we start to look um, at uh, particularly again a resurgence in uh, looking at catastrophic earthquake planning something that we kind of put on the back burner for a couple of years because of everybody's uh, focus on looking at terrorism issues but when we look at catastrophic earthquake we're going to have a big competition for big flat areas I mean that's going to be where you want to put the debris that's going to be where you want to put the trailers that's going to be where you want to stage stuff so it's important now to think about you know the big flat pieces of 
you know, uh, land in your jurisdiction and how are they going to be used and what, what's the best purpose for each one. So it may be that you do end up putting debris in the streets, or maybe it means you end up putting the trailers in the streets. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be thought through um, at the community level about how you're going to, um, to sort of use the resources that you have at hand. Uh, the Office of Emergency Services is responsible for the overall management of state disaster operations, and we work with a variety of other state agencies in identifying uh, or in carrying out those functions. Uh, our state emergency plan is very similar to the, the plans I think that you have at, uh, lo at the local level. Uh, we have um, branches that are similar to the annexes. Uh, and we, again, have other state agencies that are a lead for uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of our functions. And really our uh, construction and engineering function, which is where a lot of the debris removal um, activity sits, is kind of a, it, it, that's really a, uh, a very divergent group of folks that are lead and primary agencies. I believe um, that uh, the Integrated Waste Management Board, other aspects of Cal EPA, Department of Transportation, um, are all, uh, Department of Water Resources, are all part of that construction and engineering function. Uh, and we would also at that time kind of mirror uh, or link up with uh, the federal emergency support functions under the uh, National Response Plan where the lead for um, construction and engineering is the Corps of Engineers, but they bring in a, a cadre of folks, including um, the, the other aspects of the active military, uh, to work uh, with us. And so we do try to, to marry up with our federal partners. The State uh, Debris Management Plan um, f emphasizes the uh, effective management of de debris through, again, uh, pre-planning activities, as well as identifying um, uh, kinds of technical assistance that we may be able to provide uh, to you at the time of an event. Understanding that, in fact, uh, management of debris really is a local issue. You, you are going to be in the lead for that, and any resources that are brought in in terms of state agencies, or certainly in terms of the federal government, should be working under your direction, and, um, and that, that you're the lead for doing that, even though the, the Corps of Engineers may have contracted uh, for a debris contractor to come in. Uh, to help you out, they're really going to be following, uh, following your lead. Um, and our, our plans also seek to uh, optimize limited resources to, and to uh, provide a way for uh, passing information uh, up through, through the chain to be able to give uh, both to our decision makers at the state level as well as uh, it, our public information, the big picture of, of what's going on in terms of all aspects of, of emergency management. Really, the initial priorities will be to, to facilitate protection of health and safety, to clear debris, to assist in the rescue uh, of folks and, 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 and things of that nature. And again, this is the importance of being part of the planning and intelligence function uh, within the operations center um, and having your, um, whether it's you're called the construction and engineering branch or whether you're called the debris branch or your, what, whatever your, your term that you use in your local plan, uh, that you're a key part of that uh, emergency operation uh, function so that you have a uh, contribution into to what you can provide and that you're taking the lead from, from whatever the critical issues are that have been identified um, in your action plan uh, in your operation center. And actually, as you get into the recovery operations, you may see that, you know, as, as was mentioned, when the, the law and fire folks, you know, sort of when they're going home, it becomes really a um, recovery function is largely centered in a public works uh, or a planning uh, kind of branch uh, or uh, activity. So you may end up seeing that the, the transition of certainly the role of the operations chief may transfer to somebody from the public works department, and it could even be that the incident command transitions to somebody from uh, the uh, public works department. Again, the initial response, uh, debris clearance from roads uh, for emergency vehicles, law enforcement, uh, utilities, um, uh, restoration of utilities, um, things like that. So that, that's really in your first uh, 48 to 72 hours. Again, this is where we're sort of talking about that if necessary, time and materials contracts may be appropriate at this point in time to, uh, to make sure that these uh, critical emergency activities can, can go on, but beyond that, uh, FEMA is going to look askance at being able to um, uh, to address those or to, to use time and materials contracts for larger uh, recovery activities. Uh, 
as, as you work on your, uh, on your plan, uh, identifying your critical facilities and whether those be as the hospitals, the fire stations, or those schools or whatever that may be used as shelters, your water and wastewater facilities, any uh, power generating fo places you have uh, within your community, the airports and port areas, the, the, again, those clearance areas, know, uh, getting an idea of what kinds of debris you might be facing in those areas and how you might tackle those debris issues as you either participate as you in your uh, plans, as you do your, your forecasting, or certainly as you exercise your plans and, and sort of look at you know, what might be causing uh, what might, the hazards you might face. There are some tools such as HAZUS, the what is it, Hazard US uh, computer program that can help um, estimate <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, debris and uh, debris volumes and things like that that might be useful in uh, planning activities. And recovery, uh, long-term activities will be sort of more the more traditional sort of uh, debris uh, removal and allowing the community to, uh, to begin the process of, uh, of restoring themselves and going back as close as possible to, to pre-disaster conditions. So again, clearing, allowing for the uh, rebuilding, allow, and things like that. So as a coordination with um, local law enforcement, either if it is a uh, terrorism event and you're looking at a crime scene, or if you are um, just in cer certain things like uh, the ability to uh, direct traffic or, or things like that in order to allow you to, to do your work. I mean, as we start to calculate, we've been working uh, on a regional uh, emergency planning process with the uh, 10 counties in the San Francisco Bay Area and just trying to look at the volumes of truck traffic that we're going to be talking about in, in order to remove the debris from a catastrophic earthquake in the Bay Area and the fact that none of the landfills are, are in the Bay Area, they are, uh, they are outside the Bay Area, of just trying to imagine how we're going to be managing that many truck loads and, and trying to you know, sort of manage the, tr the, the trucks of debris, we're, we're getting resources in, getting, you know, so just, it's gonna be a, uh, a large, large um, uh, logistical and, and coordinative uh, activity. Uh, contact list, that's both your callback list for your internal activities as well as your partners in um, state agencies, neighboring jurisdictions, um, federal agencies. A pre-identification of debris management sites, understanding the you know landfill status for for those that you normally work with and those that are, that other ones that may be available. Again, environmental and historic requirements because those do will impact how you treat um, the the uh, resources from from those uh, particular facilities. And again, I reiterate uh, the need to have a standby um, and or pre-qualified list of contractors. Uh, FEMA has instituted a new contractor's registry on the FEMA national website. They are sort of advocating um, that contractors kind of pre-register themselves. The problem is there's nothing down there that they, they don't have any qualifications or any way of uh, sort of validating what the, the contractors put in. It's more just a, again, it was a response to uh, concerns from uh, Katrina that, that local uh, haul, haulers and, and local debris management companies were being neglected in favor of the large uh, contracting firms that particularly the, the Corps of Engineers was contracting with. So in order to do that, they started to put the, uh, at least they've done it, so you can, you can get on there and look and see if there's anybody that's in your area and maybe you want to contact ahead of time and find out at least what their uh, capabilities are, how to contact them, and whether they would be um, interested in, in sort of working in your area at the time of, uh, of an event. So again, it's something that's, that, that's on there. It's, again, it's, there's, I, I looked at it yesterday. There's only, I think, eight folks registered for California. But again, it's, it's really right now focused, as is just about everything else FEMA's doing right now on the Gulf states. So having um, sample contracts, um, scopes of work, um, you know, that you can, uh, you can use, you can take off the shelf, you can fill into, to meet your uh, immediate situation and help you at least have something in place so that you don't get caught in this um, 
the time and materials uh, contract problem that we're that we're currently dealing with. Having forms, um, uh, ready supply of forms, the rights of entry, uh, hold harmless insurance coverage, all that sort of stuff to allow you to to enter onto private property or to carry out um, your sort of your plan for um, you know shared responsibilities. And again, looking at mutual aid agreements, both um, through. Uh, our mutual aid agreements within the state of California. Now that we are also members of the Emergency Management Assistance Compact, we can reach out to other states um, for assistance. Um, and there's certainly through uh, requests for federal assistance, we can access um, federal assets as well. So again, there's lots of, of mutual aid out there in terms of uh, providing a variety of kinds of assistance. Finally, go through the process of adopting your plan, uh, training on the plan, and that's not just training on the plan itself, but as was mentioned, um, participating in just general, gen your general emergency management training for your community, as well as being aware of um, SEMS, NIMS, and ICS training, as NIMS is now a national requirement. Um, not exactly certain how they're going to enforce that, and, but also one of the things, it's an element of NIMS, will eventually be um, credentialing. So yeah, that if you're going to serve as a, an operations chief, you'll have to meet certain uh, training requirements to be a credentialed um, operations chief or incident commander. Um, I'm not certain how deep down that's going to, <clears throat> excuse me, go into the emergency management organization, but certainly for operations chiefs and incident command, or uh, uh, section chiefs and incident commanders, <coughs> excuse me, that, there'll be that requirement. Again, exercising the plan at any opportunity you have, whether that's through an, uh, just an internal exercise um, specific to your debris management plan and maybe your departmental operations center, that function as part of a larger uh, community exercise uh, involving, for example, as we look at um, our community emergency response teams, a lot of communities have um, certs uh, where you may have uh, folks in the community that can uh, provide some assistance uh, to you and into your debris operations or at least certainly in, in providing public information. And then finally using uh, results of exercises, results of actual events or even just changes and as we're seeing now in, in federal policy to, to update your plan. As I mentioned, there's a lot of new policies that have come out um, as a result of um, the uh, Katrina activities. Uh, there's a new uh, uh, recovery strategy that's posted on the FEMA website that de de deals specifically with uh, debris operations. Uh, looking at, there was some discussion or problem in, in the, the Gulf Coast that things that were contracted with the Corps of Engineers were being paid at 100 percent, whereas what was being paid for by uh, the communities um, and the state were being reimbursed at 90 percent. So they found at the or the, right when the 100 percent was going to be um, tailed out, that everybody switched to uh, Corps of Engineers contracts. And it took them a while to figure out, why did everybody switch to Corps of Engineers contracts? Well, because they were fully funded and uh, the local ones weren't. Now they've, they've fixed that to, to kind of match it. Um, they've looked there, uh, again, the, they've instituted the uh, debris um, con contractor registry. Uh, there's some, uh, some other elements of, of the policy. So I would uh, suggest uh, going on the, the FEMA website and just taking a look at, at that policy.